All right, let's see. Uh, let's try this again. The joys of doing Zoom. I know. <laughs> okay, there we go. There you go, okay. Okay, so um, what my lab um, studies and looks at is how and why we sleep. Um, and we're a basic science lab, which means we don't study people. We actually study animals and how they sleep and why they sleep. Uh, with a particular focus, of course, on narcolepsy and another sleep disorder that I'll talk to you about in a moment. So although we study how and why we sleep, we're really focused on studying um, uh, rapid eye movement or REM sleep. You might also know it as dreaming sleep. Um, and what we're really trying to figure out is how does the brain get us into REM sleep and out of REM sleep? And what you're looking at here on the, the right side of, of my slide is a human brain and then zoomed in is uh, the brain stem. So that's the, the bottom part of your brain here. And that's really the most important part of the brain in many ways because it's the most primitive part and it's responsible for all those fundamental behaviors like moving, eating and sleeping. And so what we're trying to figure out in my lab is how does healthy REM sleep work? What parts of the brain do it? How do those parts of the brain talk to, talk to each other? And we're actually even more specifically interested in this, this condition called REM sleep paralysis. And everyone listening is familiar with REM sleep paralysis. It's the complete relaxation of muscles as you go into dreaming sleep. And the brain and the body are incredibly uh, smarter in, in paralyzing the muscles of your body as you sleep, except of those uh, required for breathing. Um, and we're interested in trying to understand REM sleep paralysis because we think that, that problems with the normal brain circuits back in this part of your brain in the brainstem um, might underlie uh, specific disorders uh, such as narcolepsy and another um, condition that we study called REM sleep behavior disorder. So we're really trying to understand how does healthy REM sleep occur so that we can understand how when things go wrong with this normal process, how does that potentially contribute, for example, to narcolepsy and particularly to the cataplexy uh, that occurs in people with narcolepsy. And I'm gonna show you a video and, and I apologize, many of you will be very familiar with cataplexy, which is one of the most uh, troubling symptoms in people with narcolepsy. But this is a lovely uh, young uh, woman who I had the privilege of meeting after the Toronto Star wrote an article about some of our research. And her name is Shannon and um, this is a video showing Shannon who has narcolepsy having an episode of cataplexy. And I'm gonna play the video and I'm gonna turn off the sound. Okay, it's off. And what I want you to pay attention to is number one, Shannon is at her 28th birthday party. So she's not, you know, crazy wearing this hat just every day. Um, and what I'm hoping you can see is this is her uncle here and he put his arm around Shannon because she's starting to experience an episode of cataplexy. And what Shannon's trying to do in this video, even though she's experiencing cataplexy, her muscles are beginning to be very weak. Um, she's unable to support herself and you can see this through her head starting to slump down because the muscles that normally help to keep her body functioning are relaxing too much. And at this point, Shannon has lost the battle with this muscle paralysis uh, known as cataplexy. And she's completely unable to move. And luckily her uncle is sitting here holding her up. And what my lab is very interested in is how does this happen? What's going on in the brain to cause this abnormality in normal muscle control. And I brought up the idea of REM sleep in the previous slide and what we think in my lab and many other labs around the world um, think that maybe what's happening is the, the, the brain uh, circuits or parts of the brain that normally kick on this muscle relaxation during dreaming sleep have somehow started to kick on uh, while uh, people are awake and people with narcolepsy are experiencing cataplexy because the same processes that relax muscles in dreaming or REM sleep turn on while uh, they're awake. 
And I want to show you next in this video, the complete opposite of this. And this is a, there are three different gentlemen in this video. Um, they're all in REM sleep. And unlike healthy REM sleep, these individuals are acting out their dreams. So what you saw in the previous video with Shannon and cataplexy was in a sense, muscles falling asleep while you're awake. And in this video, um, this is the complete opposite, which is muscles waking up when you're in sleep. And so what you're gonna see in this gentleman who's actually in a, a, a sleep lab in a hospital in Minnesota, and he has all the, the wires connecting him up so we know that he's in uh, dreaming or REM sleep. You can see this very unusual movement that would, would not happen in an otherwise healthy individual. And so he is experiencing this uh, disorder called REM sleep behavior disorder. This is another gentleman also experiencing, experiencing an episode of REM sleep behavior disorder. And again, the thing that I want you to pay attention to is how awake his muscles are, even though he's completely unconscious uh, and asleep and in specific in dreaming sleep. And so what my lab is interested in is, is what's going on in the brain and how are those normal parts of the brain that, that generate healthy REM sleep or dreaming sleep contributing potentially uh, to cataplexy where the muscles might be falling asleep while you're awake. And I'm gonna sort of take a little departure from what my lab is working on and give you a little bit of a history um, about what we know about the brain and sleep and narcolepsy. And because as I move forward in my talk, I'm gonna start sort of introducing different parts of the brain and how they're involved uh, in narcolepsy and in uh, sleep contro controlling normal sleep. Now this very dapper gentleman is a neurologist and an Austrian neurologist who has, I think the most fabulous name in any of science. His name is Constance, Constantine, Baron Constantine von Economo. And what uh, he uh, discovered in the early 1900s was during the Spanish uh, flu epidemic of encephalitis, encephalitis uh, lethargica was that a very specific part of the brain was affected in, in this uh, um, unfortunate disease. And what he found was that this virus seemed to attack a very particular part of the brain that led to symptoms that were very similar to what we see in people with narcolepsy. And so what uh, uh, Baron uh, von Economo found was he first identified a brain area that might be linked to narcolepsy symptoms. And you might be asking, well, why is he talking about this? Because we know that narcolepsy is caused by um, changes in the way the, the brain functions. And what Dr. Uh, von Economo found was a particular brain area that when it was killed in this um, unfortunate uh, uh, epidemic um, caused symptoms that looked a lot like narcolepsy. So people were often very sleepy, they had, uh, unusual sleep, and some of these patients even experienced episodes of cataplexy. And what Dr. Uh, von Economo found was that a very, very restricted part of the brain was uh, eaten away by uh, this disorder, and it's called uh, the, uh, the hypothalamus. And this is, again, the brain stem, this hind part of the brain. And just in front of that, towards your eyes, is the hypothalamus, um, an area that when it was um, degenerated in these people with uh, the Spanish flu, caused these symptoms that looked very, very similar uh, to some of the aspects of narcolepsy. And so this was our first scientific clue coming from patients who had degeneration in a very restricted part of the brain that maybe that part of the brain, the hypothalamus, might be involved in, in some of the symptoms uh, that people with narcolepsy experience. And about 80 years later, this very same part of the brain, the hypothalamus, what a brand new brain chemical was discovered. And that brain chemical um, appears to be associated uh, with uh, narcolepsy. 
And that brain chemical in the hypothalamus uh, is called orexin. Um, and it's also called um, by another name, hypocretin. But today I'm gonna to talk about it and just use the name orexin because I think uh, just keeping it simple is important. So what you're looking at here is, is a section through a mouse's brain and all these little star-like structures are individual brain cells that make a chemical called orexin. And here on the right side, you can see these beautiful little cells that look like stars to me. And they're all making this chemical called orexin. And this chemical was only discovered in 1999. And so scientists were really curious, like, what is this chemical? We didn't know what it was before, but it's in the hypothalamus. And we know that the hypothalamus appears to be important in controlling sleep and that damage to that part of the brain causes sleepiness and other symptoms that look uh, like pe that, that people with narcolepsy experience. So what scientists uh, then wanted to find out was, well, where does a rex and where do these cells project in the brain? And so what you're looking at here is a side view. So if I, if you were looking at me, this is a side view, but this is a mouse's brain. So it's bigger than mine. Um, and what scientists found was that these cells restricted in this tiny little area of the brain seem to project all over the brain. So they project up into the front of the brain, uh, the middle of the brain, the back of the brain, and they go all the way down into the spinal cord. But what's really interesting is these orexin cells seem to communicate or talk to areas of the brain that are really important in controlling sleep and wakefulness. And so this observation that, that these, these cells that make this brain chemical called orexin, um, they seem to talk to the areas that are important in making having normal sleep-wake control. And I'm not going to go into any more detail other than to say what scientists then found, uh, looking at uh, studies from rats, mice, dogs, and monkeys, is that if you remove these orexin cells, animals seem to become very sleepy, um, off, sort of resembling what people with narcolepsy experience. So these orexin cells became known as wake-promoting cells because when they're gone um, in, in animals, when we can genetically remove them or, or, or lesion them from the brain, these animals became sleepy and they had less wakefulness. So together, all the information I've told you about these orexin cells suggests that they're important for wakefulness. Well, what happens and what happens to them in people with narcolepsy? And this was um, a study done by a, a whole group of people, but one of them being my scientific mentor at UCLA, Jerry Siegel, and Emmanuel Mignot at Stanford, what they actually found was that these orexin cells are lost in people with narcolepsy. And this is, I can't tell you what a, an amazing scientific discovery uh, this was, and of course, an incredibly important clinical tool in understanding the causes of narcolepsy. So what I'm showing you here on this panel is slices through people's brains who had narcolepsy, who passed away from other causes and donated their brains to science. And what they found was that people with narcolepsy had almost no orexin cells left. So here on the, the left side are people who don't have narcolepsy and all these little brown dots are these cells that make orexin. And then in, in histology or, or looking at the brain tissue in very close detail. So this is one tiny cell, one tiny cell, one tiny cell. Then you look at the brain of people who have passed away who had narcolepsy and none of those cells are present. And more interestingly and, and importantly, frankly, is if you then sample the amount of orexin that's in the, the, uh, the fluid that bathes the brain and spinal cord in people with narcolepsy, they have almost no orexin present. So it's almost at zero. And that's compared to people without narcolepsy. So together, these two pieces of information were incredibly important in understanding the root cause of narcolepsy in that these cells that make orexin that keep patients awake or people awake um, are lost in people with narcolepsy. And it seems that this loss of these orexin cells is a major contributor to the symptoms that underlie uh, narcolepsy. Well, because I don't study people, as I told you, I study animals. We wondered, well, what would happen if we pluck these orexin cells out of mice and rats? 
Um, so would the animals start to look like people with narcolepsy? So um, what others, a whole group of scientists around the world did was to actually do that using very sophisticated genetic tools. It allowed them to basically go into the brain and remove these orexin cells from mice and rats. And here is a, a section through a, a mouse's brain. And again, all these little starlight white dots are, uh, is a mouse that has orexin in its brain. And here's a mouse in which we've genetically removed orexin from the brain. And what was really incredible is that just removing these orexin cells genetically from the brain caused these mice to have symptoms of narcolepsy. So the mice often slept more and more importantly for what I'm gonna talk about today, the mice experience episodes that look a lot like cataplexy that I showed you in that video with Shannon. So it appears that even in both humans and in rodents and dogs and monkeys, that if you remove these erection cells, um, humans and mice uh, and other animals develop all the, the sort of feature symptoms that you see in people with narcolepsy. And so this was an incredibly important uh, finding because it, it led us down a path of understanding how is narcolepsy, um, what are some of the brain causes of narcolepsy. And so this, I'm going to now really focus for the rest of my talk on how does cataplexy happen? Because that's really the, the work that we put the most energy into in my lab over the last 10 years. And so this is a very complicated, busy table, but it's basically linking all of the features that you see in people with narcolepsy and mice that have no orexin. So I call them mice with narcolepsy because they have two things that are very similar to people with narcolepsy. They have cataplexy and that cataplexy is triggered both in humans and in, in our mice by changes in emotional state. So I know a lot of you are very familiar with the fact that um, sudden changes in emotional uh, scenarios like laughter or joking or surprise or fear can cause cataplexy. And we found that in mice, the exact same thing happens. These mice have these episodes where they just lose their muscle tone, even though they're wide awake um, and they fall to the floor of, of their cages. And so it's, it's the two things that are really important to think about when, as a scientist, is that cataplexy is caused by muscle paralysis or weakness, but it's triggered by strong emotions generally. And so why I've underlined these two things is what we're trying to figure out is what causes this muscle weakness or paralysis and cataplexy, but then what triggers that, um, uh, that loss of muscle tone um, that occurs typically with strong positive emotions. So a colleague of mine in Italy named uh, Giuseppe Platzi did this study where he took little kids who have uh, narcolepsy and particularly of very strong uh, periods of cataplexy. And he put them into a brain imaging machine to look and see what parts of the brain are changing when, when these kids with uh, uh, narcolepsy and cataplexy experienced a period of cataplexy. And what Dr. Platzi found quite remarkably is this tiny little dot here and again, this is the brainstem, that back part of the brain that my lab is very invested in understanding its role in REM sleep, found that an area that we and others had been studying lights up as a child has cataplexy. And this area of the brain has a, a rather long name called the sub uh, dorsolateral tegmental area, but I'm just gonna call it for your ears, uh, uh, the SLD, which is its abbreviation. And my lab has been studying this area of the brain because we know that this SLD in the brainstem is really important in causing relaxation of the muscles during REM sleep. And so what we wondered was, well, wow, what, it seems to be turning on when a child with narcolepsy has cataplexy. Could this tiny little area of the brain that causes the muscles to relax during REM sleep underlie the causes of cataplexy? that muscle relaxation that occurs. 
And so um, that was the sort of question that I'm going to talk about now, is what happens if we can um, manipulate this area of the brain called the SLD, that when becomes activated, the muscles relax during REM sleep, but no one had ever tested whether these cells in this part of the brain actually were underlying cataplexy. And so that's the set of experiments I'm gonna to talk to you about. And, and this is just a very complicated slide and I don't really want you to pay much attention to it, but it's the human brain. And it's actually all the connections that we really understand today in 2021 um, parts of the brain that might underlie cataplexy. But I don't want you to focus on them other than this tiny little area way in the back of your brain called the SLD that causes your muscles to go to sleep during REM sleep. And what we've been able to do, and, and this is really remarkable, and I want to make it entirely clear that I did not develop these techniques. These were developed by by folks at MIT, Harvard, and Stanford, we've been able to use this new technique called optogenetics, which allows us to genetically turn on this any cell in the brain that we would like or turn it off. And we can do this with light. So we can deliver using a virus, uh, a specific protein to cells, for example, in the SLD, and either turn them on or turn them off and then find out, do they contribute to cataplexy? And this technique is called opto uh, genetics. So opto for using light to turn them on or off and genetics for being able to genetically target a very particular cell group in the brain. And this approach allows us the most remarkable um, ability to turn them off and turn them on in the same time frame that they would normally occur uh, in, in, in the, in the, under normal conditions in the brain. And so this is what we did in the experiments I'm going to talk about now. We use this, this tool, this very cool uh, tool to turn on these uh, uh, SLD cells and see what happens to cataplexy in mice with narcolepsy. And if you're following along with me, I'm hoping that you might have pieced together that if we turn the cells on that cause muscle relaxation, we should make cataplexy worse. And conversely, if we can shut these cells off, we should make cataplexy better or even go away. And so what we found was this, and this was really, I think it's one of the highlights of my career over the last 18 years, is that when we turn these cells on in a mouse, and this is a, a mouse that doesn't have narcolepsy, we can make this mouse look like it's having an episode of cataplexy. And so what you're looking at here is one of our mouse, we're switching on the SLD and you're gonna see this little mouse is just grooming himself and bloop, we switch those cells on and the mouse loses all of his muscle tone, falls to his cage floor. You can see he's not moving. And then all of a sudden, just as quickly as he fell into that, that lack of ability to move, he wakes up. So this, uh, it looks very similar to some types of cataplexy in people with narcolepsy. And I'm sorry, this is a very busy slide, but I only want you to focus on a couple of things. So what we found was, and this is a little cartoon, that we have a mouse who's normally awake, he's happily moving around his cage. Um, we turn these cells on in this specific area of the brain called the SLD, and he immediately has loss of muscle tone and we did a lot of work. The mouse hasn't fallen asleep. He's actually quite awake. Uh, he just has the inability to move. And so what you're looking at here is this mouse's behavior over a three hour period. And these little red lines represent every time the mouse had an episode of cataplexy before we turned on these cells. And then I hope you can see this is what happens to this very same mouse when we turn these cells on you can see that it's almost all cataplexy that this mouse has experienced. Um, hundreds of episodes over this three hour period simply caused by turning on a tiny, tiny little area in the brainstem. The area in this mouse is about the size of a pinhead. So it's very tiny, but it has a very powerful effect. And in fact, these experiments were done in mice that already had narcolepsy. And so we simply turned these cells on and made this narcolepsy terrible, terrible for these poor mice. But the good news is, is that when we silenced or stopped these cells from being active, 
we completely stopped cataplexy or almost completely stopped cataplexy from happening in, happening in our narcoleptic mice. And this is the only thing I want you to focus on in this busy slide is here's how many times a mouse had cataplexy in a three hour period, just around three. And this is under normal conditions for this mouse with narcolepsy. Then we shut those cells off and the mouse had more than 70 to 80% suppression. So turning these cells off seems to prevent cataplexy. So what we have identified here is a very tiny pin, pin sized um, uh, region of, of the brain stem in a mouse that appears to be critical for cataplexy. But remember I told you that cataplexy is often triggered by emotions. So clearly there's something else going on that causes this part of the brain to cause cataplexy. So we wanted to take a look at, at some of the options that, that might be um, causing this emotionally induced triggering of cataplexy. Now, I can't hear anyone, but people usually chuckle when I show this slide because we're faced with a problem in mice is we can't ask them how they're feeling before they have an episode of cataplexy. So the little face of our mouse looks very similar to at least to us when the mouse is happy, sad, <laughs> mad, surprised, shamed, uh, feeling sad for itself. Um, and so we couldn't really um, with accuracy determine what emotions are causing cataplexy. So what we wanted to do was go to a part of the brain that we know mediates emotion and then change its activity and see if that impacted cataplexy. So some of you have probably heard of the amygdala. It's a very important part of the brain that seems to respond um, to changes in emotion and it's important in regulating healthy emotions. And what colleagues of mine at UCLA had done was shown that cells in the amygdala quite remarkably become very active during cataplexy, suggesting that the amygdala, which regulates emotion, switches on during emotionally cued events, which in this case is giving a dog with narcolepsy some food, which is very exciting. The, dog, the dog's amygdala turns on, and you can see it turns on because there's not much activity. This is just the amount of activity in the amygdala. It turns on at the very same time this dog has cataplexy. And what you're looking at here is the level of muscle activity before cataplexy and then the lack of muscle activity during cataplexy, and then the return of muscle activity at the end of cataplexy. But what's important is the amygdala seems to track this cataplexy very carefully. And so because the amygdala is Im important for emotion and it turns on during cataplexy, we wondered what would happen if we tweaked the amygdala, that critical emotional part of the brain, what would happen to cataplexy? Could we make it worse and could we make it better by either shutting the amygdala off and suppressing cataplexy or turning the amygdala on and making cataplexy worse. And so that's exactly what we found. Here's one of our mice with narcolepsy and here's the actual amygdala in a highly zoomed in area. And there are thousands of tiny little red cells here. Here's a zoomed in uh, one tiny cell in the amygdala and this is all the cells in the amygdala. And what we found is that when we activated cells in the amygdala, we made cataplexy terrible for our poor little narcoleptic mice. So here's the, the normal one, two, three episodes of cataplexy in a mouse with narcolepsy, just when it was running around its cage. And then here's what happened to that mouse when we activated the amygdala that's really important in interpreting emotion, even in mice. You can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen 15 episodes of cataplexy when we activate the amygdala. So it seems that the amygdala, which is important in interpreting emotion, is important in triggering cataplexy. And so the last thing I wanna talk about um, is shifting away again from our work and ask the question, well, why are Rexin cells damaged in people with narcolepsy? And we don't have a clear understanding of this, and I'm not gonna go into the details behind it, but we think that there may be an unusual immune system response so that the immune system, for some reason, it accidentally attacks orexin cells in people with narcolepsy. 
and it leads to their death. And one of the clues that we have is that almost all the people with narcolepsy have a very unusual change in a particular gene called the HELA gene. And that leads us to think that there is an immune issue in individuals with narcolepsy and that, the, that this presence of this gene might lead to the immune system accidentally targeting um, and um, uh, effectively knocking out the orexin cells to underlie narcolepsy. So at the end of the day, the issue, and I hope you have uh, digested this, is that the loss of orexin cells is really important in, in the cause of, of narcolepsy in, in, in people with narcolepsy and in our animals. So one of the strategies that we've been working on, and I'm not going to talk about this because my student's going to talk about this at two o'clock, Sarah Pintwala, really an amazing student that I've had the pleasure of working with over the last five years. Um, what about rescuing those cells? Could we make new orexin cells and replace the ones that are lost in people with narcolepsy? And as I mentioned, Sarah's a, really an ingenious PhD student, and we had an opportunity to make orexin cells in a dish and then put them back into the brains of mice with narcolepsy, so mice that don't have orexin cells, and then determine whether replacing orexin cells might rescue the sleepiness and cataplexy that occurs in our mice with narcolepsy. And so what you're looking at here is a, I think it's just so beautiful. It's a cell that Sarah made in a dish um, and it's an orexin cell. And so I'm not gonna talk any more about it other than to say that we think we're, we're currently working on this idea of replacing these orexin cells that are lost in people with narcolepsy by effectively growing them in a dish and then putting them back into the brain of mice with narcolepsy. We're not doing this in people, but this is just an idea that we have and, and hopefully it might have important therapeutic value for, for individuals who have narcolepsy. So with that being said, I'm just gonna come to the end. What I hope that you remember from my talk today is that the loss of orexin cells seems to be the most um, important event leading to narcolepsy in, in um, people with narcolepsy. And that a part of the brain way back in the, the base of the brain, the SLD that causes muscles to relax in REM sleep seems to be activated during cataplexy. And if we you know, experimentally activate it in mice, we can make cataplexy much worse. And when we shut it off, we can make cataplexy much better. And then lastly, the amygdala, which is that one part of the brain that's really important in, in emotions, that when we take control of that area, we can actually make cataplexy much worse in mice. And when we suppress its activity, we can make cataplexy much better. And lastly, and this is what Sarah is going to talk to you about at two o'clock is, is there, um, what's the bright future of using replacing orexin cells into the brain of people who have lost orexin cells? And is that a potential treatment for individuals with narcolepsy? And the last thing I want to say is that there's, I'm just the voice today, but there's a lot of people who do all the hard work. And they're listed all, these are some of the people been in my lab uh, currently and who have been in my lab. Um, and a lot of the work today was done by my longtime colleague, Jimmy Frain, Zoltan Torrentelli. Sarah's gonna talk about her work. And then Matthew Snow is another great student who did a lot of this work. And lastly, I just want everyone to understand how valuable wake up narcolepsy is for you because they've been incredibly helpful in funding this research and making these things happen so that we can really develop a brighter future for people who have a narcolepsy in terms of understanding why, why it's caused and more importantly, how can we help you um, um, improve the symptoms that you have. So with that said, I thank you for your time and I'm more than happy to take your questions. Thank you so much. Um, there's so much content in there that's relevant and even new. And I've sort of heard a few talks um, similar on similar lines, but that was extremely informative. So thank you. Um, so we do have a question. Uh, if you do want to type in the Q&A, please do. There'll be a few minutes. 
Um, I loved how you said the beautiful cells that Sarah created, and I'm really excited to hear her presentation as well to follow on from yours. Um, so I will ask a question from Shannon Hall. Does the amount of orexin loss dictate how severe a person's level of cataplexy is? Um, that's a very interesting question. And there's a little bit of debate around that one. Um, there, there, is, there is one person, there is one brain collected at UCLA in which the person seemed to have um, orexin cells present and had cataplexy, which was very unusual finding. But what I'm gonna talk to, and I think this is some amazing work that Dr. Siegel at UCLA has done, is he's found that people who use morphine-like drugs, who had um, narcolepsy, they actually have an increase in their orexin cell levels um, and an improvement in some of their symptoms. So there's, there's a very strong correlation between amount of, of orexin cells and cataplexy and other disease symptoms. Is it still the case that to determine in a human how much orexin they have, they will need to have a spinal tap? Is that still the case? Yeah, as far as I know, um, you still need to do a spinal tap to really assess accurately. Um, whether orexin is present or absent or how, you know, how much is in the cerebral spinal fluid. But I mean, it, it, it does sound kind of scary to have a spinal tap, but, you know, these are things that they do for epidurals every day for hundreds of thousands of women around the world. So, um, it, you know, despite the scariness of it, it's a really important test to really understand what's going on with orexin levels in, in your brain. So you also said that in people with narcolepsy, the orexin has been destroyed. Do you have any views on anticipating if you replace their orexin with treatment further down the line, how do we know that that orexin won't be rejected by the body as well? Well, that's a great question, Claire. Um, and one of the amazing things, and Sarah's not gonna go into uh, these details, is the cells that we've made are are very resistant to the natural uh, immune attack of the body because they're actually foreign orexin cells. Um, and, but at the end of the day, we really don't know if they will be rejected. They're certainly not in mice, um, you know, and, and Sarah will talk about it, but I'll just mention it. It's amazing that we can make a cell in a dish and in, in put it into the brain of a living creature, a mouse, and that the brain doesn't kill that cell. We were quite frankly, really surprised. And because I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a, um, a rebel when it comes to certain things, people said, what a crazy idea you're trying to make these cells in a dish, put them in the brain of a mouse. They're just gonna be killed by the brain and the body because they're gonna be recognized as foreign objects. And um, they weren't. Some of them are certainly dying but we're still able to measure many of them. And Sarah's gonna show you some lovely pictures where we can still see these beautiful cells that light up like little stars in the brain of a mouse after they've been transplanted there. So they certainly live. Okay, how'd you put them in? Oh, it, it's, it's very simple. We, we put the mice to sleep so they don't feel anything. We drill a tiny little hole in the skull and we literally inject them. It's very, it's quite sophisticated. We just don't yeah. stick a needle in. There's yeah. a machine that allows us to go to a very specific part of the brain and inject them. But at the end of the day, it's just a very tiny needle that slowly, slowly puts those cells into the brain. Well, presumably that's not gonna be the approach for people with narcolepsy when orexin comes out. Um, well, that's a good question how you would get them there. But you know, this has been done in in other in other, you know, conditions like Parkinson's, where they've actually put cells into the brain of people with Parkinson's using the exact same approach. Mm -hmm. So it's not it sounds kind of scary, but it's actually not at all. I mean, it, it's it's quite a straightforward procedure. Um, I have a question actually going back to our Baron and the Spanish flu and how that triggered the loss of orexin. Um, from that, is there any link with other forms of flu 
that you can comment on causing narcolepsy given his research all that time ago because it was the Spanish flu right? Yeah it was the Spanish flu. I actually don't know if anyone's actually gone back to look. Mm -hmm. I mean he did he did an amazing um, thing which he you know he actually it, it sounds so simple but you know he was working in 1918 and he didn't have all the cool tools that we have today clinically and scientifically. And he, uh, number one, noticed that these changes these people had, they were often very sleepy or they had disturbed sleep and cataplexy-like symptoms. And then he literally, unfortunately, when some of them passed away, he sliced up their brains to say like, number one, I think something's going wrong, wrong in the brain. And he found this very restricted area of the brain that seems to be targeted. Why it was targeted? unclear um but that observation i can't underscore how important that was for the whole birth of mm -hmm. sleep science yeah it's incredible i could go on and on asking you questions but i do want to uh, invite you um our audience to support dr peeva's work and the team uh by going onto our wake up narcolepsy so it's www.wakeupnarcolepsy.org and there's a donate button and that will give you an option to specifically to donate to research um, and every year we hope to continue to support dr peeva's efforts because they're so important and the progress that you've made over the last few years has been incredible so it's always nice trying to keep up with you dr peeva thank you so much for your time do stay with us because um, Sarah is going to present and continue this conversation in about an hour. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. It's a pleasure. Yeah, of course. <laughs>